Hello everyone and welcome to my channel. Please don't forget to subscribe, like, comment, and hit the bell button. safety announcements. River Palace has enough buoyancy apparatus on board for all passengers. Located on the upper deck we have orange buoyant apparatus and also orange life rings. In addition to these we have two inflatable life rafts. Downstairs in the main saloon we have fire extinguishers. Behind the bar we have a first aid kit for my son of George Stevenson of Stevenson's yeah, rocket well, fame. Bridge is unusual in its design. Train lines are higher than the walkway, so if you're walking across the bridge and a train comes along, it will rumble along at head height. In 2015, the entire top of the bridge was removed and replaced by the section that we will shortly pass under. Two large cranes came along, lifted off the entire top of the bridge and dropped it into a nearby car park over on the right hand side. They then dropped this newer section into place. Preparation for this lift was over six months in planning. When it came time to lift the bridge, it only took two days and two nights to accomplish, so it was quite quick overall. One of the many reasons they changed the top of the bridge over in the first place was holes were starting to appear by the tracks. Sometimes when trains used to come across, some of the stone ballast used to shake loose and fall through the gaps into the river below. It could be particularly hazardous if you're taking a boat under there at that particular moment. For all intents and purposes, the bridge we're about to pass under is practically brand new. There should be no holes developing for well over a hundred years. Perfectly safe to take boats under again.
river whose spelt, O-U-S-E, comes from an old Saxon word meaning clear and flowing water. I'm sure you will agree that the use is flowing. It just doesn't look particularly clear. The reason for this is it travels through a lot of peatland on its way down here, bringing with it all kinds of sediment as it goes. Despite the way that it looks, it's clean enough to support quite a lot of aquatic life, and you will find the following fish species here in the ooze. We have tench, perch and chub, pike and eels, and believe it or not, on the upper reaches, there is also salmon and trout. Oh. The question we get asked quite often is, how deep is the river? Obviously, it can vary in places. I was speaking to some fishermen fairly recently who said, on the other side of Neyburn Lock, which is about five miles behind us, they let out seven metres of fishing line in the middle of the river and touch the bottom with that. However, on this particular stretch, I would estimate the depth in the centre channel to be somewhere in the region of four metres. It does run quite shallow to hear the riverbank as well, less than a metre in most places, so not that deep at all. Across the fields to the right hand side in the far distance we have a very grand red and white brick building. This is St. Peter's School. It's one of the oldest established schools in the country, if not the world. It was originally founded in the year 627 by the Archbishop Paul Linus. Over the years it's had quite some famous pupils attend, one of which was John Barry, who is best known as a composer for popular movie themes, most notably the James Bond theme for the James Bond movies. Mr Barry wrote the soundtrack to 11 Bond films as well as some others, such as Dancers with Wolves and Out of Africa. Another pupil at that same school, although quite some time ago now, was Guy Fawkes, leader of the infamous Gunpowder Plots of 1605, and some people say the only honest man to ever enter the House of Parliament. Like a lot of places in the UK, the school does have a bonfire and firework display on the 5th of November. The only real difference is they do not burn an effigy of Guy Fawkes. This is because they believe it would be in bad taste to burn an effigy of a former pupil. The school also claims to have Guy Fawkes's original school desk there also, complete with his name scratched into it. Over to our right hand side we have some stone steps that lead up from the river towards a large green boathouse. This is the boathouse of St Peter's Rowing Club, part of St Peter's School. Rowing is quite a popular pastime here on the Utes. Professional competitors from all over the UK come to race on this river. If we were to continue in this direction for a further 28 miles, we would eventually find ourselves in Ripon. There the River Ouse is joined by the rivers Nid and the River Swale. The river then changes its name to the River Ure. To get to Ripon, we need a much smaller boat than this one, due to the narrowing of the river in places. Also, there are some locks to navigate. It's estimated it would take nine hours. The last means I want to go left or port. Three means I want to go reverse or astern. Since we are turning on the bend of the river, I'm required to sound the horn twice before turning. It can be a little bit on the loud side. I'm just going to sound the horn now.
Bell Towers in the foreground. In the background we have the Great Central Tower. The Great Central Tower. It should come as no surprise that it costs quite a lot of money to keep York Minster in a good condition. A 1967 survey revealed that parts of the Minster, including the foundations to the Great Central Tower, were at risk of collapse. By 1972, two million pounds have been raised and work began to reinforce the structure. All well and good till you get to the 9th of July 1984, where a fire, believed to be caused by a lightning strike of all things, set fire to the roof of the south transept. That cost a further 2.5 million pounds to put right. This area was named Ibaracum, around 480 or between 7,000 and 8,000 BC. In this area, on the river, around the location of the Scarborough Rail Bridge, Bronze Age fleets tools and weapons were found by Holgate Bay, which runs between the railway and the river to our right hand side. Over to our left, we have some houses that have been built quite close to the river. And as we pass, you may notice they have two garden walls. A normal garden wall at the bottom. The next wall up is a flood defence wall. Each house has its own section of flood wall and its very own flood gates. These were installed in 1999, no moment too soon. As the record floods of the year 2000 raised the river level to 17 foot and 10 inches higher than normal. Over there, the high water stopped just two inches from the top of the upper flood wall, so it was quite a close call.
just past the tower, on the left, we have museum gardens. Yes, we have Lendl Bridge. Lendl Bridge was designed by Thomas Page, the same architect and engineer who designed and built London's Westminster Bridge. There are some similarities in the design between the two, especially with the lamps at the road level and the railings. Originally, a toll had to be paid in order to cross here. strong carriages. Lendl Bridge was built in 1863. It's the second attempt at building a bridge here. Three years earlier, in 1860, a bridge which was designed by William Dredge collapsed during its construction. There were some fatalities, unfortunately. That bridge was then salvaged from the use and then sent to Scarborough, where it became part of Scarborough's Valley Bridge. back to the 15th century. It remained in constant use all the way up to 1942, when unfortunately it was damaged during the Second World War. It was hit in its lower time. The very first bridge built here was built by the Vikings as part of their trade routes to Northern Ireland. The latest version to this one was a underground Tudor bridge, which had five arches instead of the three that we have now. Built into that Tudor bridge there was a chapel, Oxford's public toilets and also a prison. No such frills with this current tombs bridge, but it is quite solid built. It was actually built in two parts. Half of the bridge opens alongside the old tube bridge, which was then torn down, and they built the rest of the old bridge in both sides. You can still see the scene in the back where these two halves of bridge were fastened. transferred their cargo to barges. These barges in turn bring up the river to this point to the warehouses. York used to be quite well connected to the rest of the world in terms of sea trade. In more recent years the cargo in the barges consisted of cocoa, sugar and dried fruits. These were intended for the confectionery companies of round trees and terries and others who used to work here in the town. It said that when the cocoa was delivered, there were so many barges in use, you could actually walk from one side of the river to the other without getting your feet wet, just by walking across the decks of all the cocoa barges that were tied up here.
where the River Foss meets the River Ouse. York has two rivers that run through its city centre. The smaller Foss River to one side, and on this side the Ouse. But this natural defence was why York was able to prosper as a city. During the Roman conquest of Britain, the two Celtic tribes who lived in this area were known as the Brigantines and the Parisi. Eventually, over time, they began just decided that had enough and it was time to move on. So they left this northern outpost and made their way back home. Ahead of us we have Skeldegate Bridge. Skeldegate Bridge was also designed by Thomas Page. Same architect and engineer who designed the built London's Westminster Bridge, as well as Lenin Bridge that we saw earlier. Of these three arches that cross the river ahead of us, the right hand arch used to open up to allow sailing vessels through, so they didn't have to take their masts down. Spanners used to open hours. Road used to lift up like a drawbridge. Last time the right hand arch was opened was in 1971. That was to allow pair of Royal Navy in short line sweepers through and into the city as part of a courtesy visit. Since then the lifting mechanisms have mostly been removed. The right hand archway now stays permanently closed. Considering the amount of traffic that passes on the scale these days, that can only be a good thing, as York certainly doesn't need any more traffic jams. Skeldegate by name translates as streets of the shield makers. of where you have joined us, you have a choice. You can either leave us here, now at King's Stave, or ten minutes from now, clear of the exit gate. But to allow us to have a chance to pull the ropes in place, to all passengers, please remain seated until these vessels come to a complete stop. As soon as it's safe to leave at this landing, either the crew or myself will let you know. For those of you that wish to go to the Lendl Bridge landing, just stay on board. Ten minutes time from now. I hope you like this video and that's all for today. Thank you so much for watching. See you again next time. Bye bye.